Well, hello, welcome um, all. My name's uh, Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. I'm the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace. And um, this is Myths and Facts, How to Determine the Truth About Israel, Hamas, and Gaza, the Prevention of Genocide and Faithful Christian Responses. And I'm joined here by Dr. Ben Norquist, who's currently our Ambassador Warren Clark Fellow um, for Churches for Middle East Peace. Um, this event is uh, sponsored by um, Evangelicals for Justice, um, and it's a digital dialogue. So Evangelicals for Justice gathers um, once a month uh, to have conversations online about different topics related to justice, typically led by friends or board members. I'm a board members. I'm a board member of Evangelicals. For justice. This is also um, co-sponsored by the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East. So CMAP, Churches for Middle East Peace, the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East, NIMI, um, and Evangelicals for Justice, and Myths and Facts, How to Determine the Truth about Israel, Hamas, and Gaza. And we're coming together specifically um, in response um, to uh, what's been happening in Gaza, the death toll there now, more than 33,000 people. Um, currently, more than 100 people um, still being held hostage in Gaza. Um, of course, uh, October 7th, the attacks by Hamas on southern Israel that caused the death of approximately 1,200 people. Um, and so great, great trauma um, happening in Gaza uh, to um, many uh, people in Israel and internationals affected by the actions of October 7th as well. So many, many things for us to talk about. And what's it mean to understand, you know, truth in the midst of that context? And so Ben and I um, thought we would present a bit about that, um, but then talk about that together. And so I think Ben will present first, um, then I'll talk for a few minutes, and then he and I will converse a bit together, but then we'll open it up for questions. And so you can use um, the chat function, if you've not introduced yourself, feel free to say where you're from um, and your name. Um, feel free to use the chat to talk. You can also use, um, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom that you can use, but we will, um, because we're in a meeting and not a webinar, uh, we will open it up um, in a few minutes as well to be able to have a conversation. So um, Ben, I didn't introduce your bio and your many accolades and your doctorate and you know, you're awesome, but do you want to introduce yourself and then uh, give um, your comments sure. and I'll follow after you. Sounds good. Thanks, May. Um, yep, I, uh, I've been with Churches for Middle East Peace for um, almost a year in the role of Ambassador Warren Clark Fellow, which means that I've been asking questions and figuring out how to, um, you know, uh, dive into some research in response to those. One of the questions that I've been interested in over the course of the year before October 7th was, um, you know, what 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 uh, NGOs that are operating or trying to operate in, in Israel call shrinking civil space. Um, that is, uh, from a legal perspective and, you know, for a variety of other reasons, um, NGOs, you know, humanitarian oriented organizations and civil rights oriented organizations, human rights or, uh, organizations are um, finding it harder and harder to operate there. And um, so, you know, that's one of the projects I've been working on um, since October 7th, um, spent a good bit of time talking with uh, folks in Gaza about the experiences they've been having with a shortage of water in particular. And that research, um, you know, went into an article that May and I wrote and is now in uh, this month's issue of the Christian Century magazine um, about the water crisis in Gaza. <clears throat> um, yeah, and, uh, you know, the war has has affected, deeply affected my prayer life, too. Um, uh, both, you know, personally and um, and a few weeks ago was involved as the as the, still as the fellow, the 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 CMAP fellow, uh, but working with a pastor in the area who's on this call, Tiana Coleman, <laughs> um, in Chicago, uh, to uh, host an interfaith um, ceasefire pilgrimage 
and we had 250 folks show up uh, from Christian, uh, Jewish, and Muslim communities throughout Chicago and to pray for a ceasefire and pray for, um, you know, uh, aid to get in to Gaza where it's needed and um, and so on and so forth. So um, I live uh, in Chicago land with my my wife and three children and um, and have the privilege of working with May and and CMAP uh, as my day job. So. Um, my 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 scholarly background um, is in education, and my dissertation was on higher education in in Palestine. Uh, I was asking what the condition of of being under occupation, um, you know, what the implications are for for operating higher education institutions in Bethlehem. Okay, so that's that's background. Um, I want to um, start my comments today by pointing to the reality that what's happening in Gaza right now um, has another layer to it. So there's what's happening in Gaza. There's, you know, what some people call the war in Gaza or the genocide in Gaza or whatever you label that. Um, there's that thing that's happening over there. You know, for most of us, it's over there. But then there's another war that's happening about that. And it's the information war. And we actually encounter that every day when we open the news, you know, when we encounter headlines. Um, there's an information war going on. In fact, Israel has a name for it, Hasbara. That's the Israeli word for for propaganda, for, you know, for this this insight, this strategic insight that um uh it matters what people think about what's happening in Gaza you know for example what american christians think about perceive and feel about what's happening in Gaza has implications for israel um so it's it's strategically important and i want to start by by actually rewinding the tape for me to my childhood, because I, as I was thinking about this, our webinar together, I was realizing that I have actually been encountering Hezbara <laughs> since I was a little tyke. <laughs> I remember one of actually one of my first uh, memories um, was being in my grandparents' house when I was five or six years old. This would have been in 1987 or 88. And looking over at the TV and seeing uh, kids on this on the TV, little kids throwing rocks at tanks, and you know that was the first intifada that I was seeing as a five-year-old. And then later on, I remember seeing images. You know, this was when I was in college of burned-out buses in Tel Aviv. And hearing the the narratives around those, um, and then later on seeing images, you know, by this time on the internet of you know, aerial pictures, aerial video of <clears throat> um, Yasser Arafat, you know, in his compound, um, surrounded, and the picture upon reflection that emerged for me as I was growing up you know, because of the particular media that I listened to and paid attention to was that Israel was a modern, um, rational uh, democracy, um, you know, committed to the rules of war. That's kind of the picture I had uh, facing up against a sea of, ir you know, irrational, irrationally violent countries surrounding it um, that's what my media ecosystem that's the picture that my media ecosystem painted for me uh, and then in my 20s i um i heard a story that changed everything for me um, i realized that my media choices had failed uh to tell the whole story um i heard a story about a little girl named abir aramin uh Palestinian girl, 10 years old. She was on her way home from school one day in her village in the West Bank. And an Israeli soldier fired a rubber bullet from nearby. Um, 
and it struck her in the back of the head and she died in the hospital the next day. Um, and the story gripped me for a few reasons. There was the obvious human tragedy of it, but also I realized that it was the first time I had ever heard a story about a Palestinian who was humanized and who whose name was used. You know, the only Palestinian name I had ever heard was Yasser Arafat. Um, so Abir Aramin, a 10-year-old girl who, through no fault of her own, was killed on her way home from school one day. And 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 it it made me realize uh, it, it it actually it it caused me to question, you know, the the sources that I had trusted up until that time to get my information about the Middle East. And so I I set off on a bit of a journey to figure out why that happened. And that's kind of the question that we're still asking actually, you know, why when we approach and, and seek to understand what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Israel, Palestine, what's happening in Gaza right now, do we, you know, and, and we make our, our first step towards sources that maybe we naturally trust, do we so quickly come upon false facts and myths? Why does that happen? And the first answer that I want to offer actually is not the right answer, but it's it's the one that is is, I think, a pretty natural one from where we sit. And that is um, the idea of media bias. You know, we think of media as being Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, you know. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with maybe some of you have run across the uh, the work of Ed Fontes Media. Uh, it's a nonprofit that has a systematic way of of classifying hundreds of media outlets by, uh, by you know, right or left leaning bias on one axis and then on the vertical axis um, newsworthiness and fact-based reporting so up at the top they put you know um, outlets that are uh, dent use dense fact patterns in their reporting and down at the bottom outright you know disinformation um, and when we encounter that and basically anywhere in that chart um, we still often run across false facts and myths about Israel-Palestine. If you've heard the phrase progressive but for Palestine, that's that's what you're running into. Um, so media bias isn't exactly it. What I want to propose is that there's a deeper ideology that actually infects so much of our media landscape right now. And it goes back to what Edward Said talked about, Orientalism. We have this, in the West, this uh, repertoire of impressions, stereotypes, memes about the East and about Middle Easterners that are deeply dehumanizing and inaccurate. They are a myth that the West created about the East and you know, historically for all different sorts of reasons. And if you want to get into that, read Edward Said's book, um, Orientalism. Um, but for our purposes today, um, th they, they map so well onto my experience of like, the impression that emerged for me naturally from all of the headlines that that I ever encountered about Palestinians, uh, it was an Orientalist picture. Um, and, uh, you know, less um, than noble actors who are out there in the media writing, you know, from a perspective on purpose to try to kind of gain a following know that about their readers and they can write in ways that activate those stereotypes without even having to say it in the article 
for in the coverage because it's already there. Um, so, um, you know, given that assessment and the reality that I, I even myself know that I've been kind of conditioned along those lines, <clears throat> there are some best practices that I try to observe when I read the news or, you know, seek to understand a particular aspect of the story. Um, and I, I thought I would just share those with you. I hope that that, uh, that they, they might be helpful to you as well. Um, one of them is don't just read the news. Re I need to be reading my own motivations for reading the news as well. So kind of reflexively understand, like checking myself, why am I reading the news right now? Because there are all different kinds of reasons I might be, and some of them are uh, are valid and some are not. You know, am I reading it to get my daily hit of indignation? I need to stop reading it at the moment, you know, and come back at some other time. Um, uh, secondly, the news alone leaves me one inch deep and easily misled. And so I need to read a book as well. And that is that is so acutely true in particular of Israel and Palestine, because if you read the headline, you know, that by definition, the headline is about what's happening in the moment. But you can't understand that that development without historical context. You just can't. And so only reading the news is a recipe for being misled and for and for deeply misunderstanding what's happening. So read the news and read historians. You know, and we've got, I'm sure we have books that we can recommend um, uh, that will provide the context, you know, that is needed for understanding um, a, a given development. Um, and then read more broadly, and not just broadly as defined by the media bias chart, but broadly in terms of geography. So if you're only reading Western commentators about what's happening in Israel and Palestine, you're not reading broadly enough. You know, you need to be hearing from Palestinians, hearing from Israelis, um, as well as, you know, whatever else you're reading. Uh, and then finally, and uh, and then I will have talked maybe just about the right amount, um, is uh, uh, that they're, they're just reminding myself again that there is an information war being waged and that um, I need to be questioning and checking the sources that I'm reading. And one of the one of the ways to do that is by reading other sources too. Um, so uh, what what am I reading at the moment? And then I'll be done. Um, this might just give you a little bit of a sense. This isn't, I'm not saying these are the ones that you should be reading um, or listening to. But to give you a sense for how it's um, it's kind of fleshed out for me at this moment, um, in the last 72 hours, I've been on the Al Jazeera website. I've been on. I've been listening to May's May May Hannon has a daily video update that she that she does. Uh, I've been listening to those. Um, I've been on the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Outreach website which is a, a really solid place to get statistics, you know, daily statistics about what's happening in Gaza. Um, I've read some releases from the Palestinian Authority, uh, some releases from the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. Um, I've read an article by uh, that's on the, the 972 magazine website. 972 is a a media collaboration between Israelis and Palestinians working together. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in what uh, evangelical institutions are saying. So I've been reading the CT Christianity Today coverage really closely, not because I, not that, and here's the other thing too, that this highlights, I'm not reading some of these sources to get facts and information. Um, I'm reading them because I want to know what they're saying. 
I want to know what CT is telling its readers, for example. Um, there we have it. I hope some of that was helpful. May, I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Um, and I, I think the comparison and the analysis of news sources is very helpful. That was one of the places that I wanted to start as well. Um, and some of what I'm going to share is a little bit, um, it's repeating some of the ideas and suggestions of best practices that you just shared, Ben, and maybe saying it in a little bit of a different way. Um, in terms of the idea of um, how do we find truth? You know, I, I I was looking for where did that statement come from that in war, truth is the first casualty. And so some have attributed that to Winston Churchill. Um, it actually is a military maxim that comes from Greek tragedy and I can't pronounce this Greek name. So I'm gonna put it in the chat because um, I have no idea how to pronounce that word. Do you know how to, Asaclius? I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce that. So, um, but that whole idea it's that- Aeschylus, Aeschylus. Oh, there you have it. Yes. Um, so this idea that uh, truth is the first tragedy in war. And, and I think, you know, we saw that early on after October where certain news sources would report something and then would backtrack. And we even saw that with President Biden where he would announce something and then backtrack. And so like, how do we determine truth? How do we understand? And honestly, I mean, we could get into a very philosophical conversation. My undergraduate degree was in HIPS, history, philosophy, and social studies of science and medicine. And we could talk about what is truth. <laughs> but we won't go down that route. Um, but I will say um, who is asking the question and what the motivations are and what um, what the perspective of news sources is um, in terms of who, uh, some of the questions of who has power, who has resources, what the motivations are, then defines what what truth looks like or how a story gets to be told. And so I'm going to remove the question a bit from Israel-Palestine for a moment. And um, I learned some very important lessons about this in terms of social justice on the south side of Chicago. Um, I lived there for 15 years. Um, and I was doing ministry um, related to uh, racial justice um, in uh, the city of Chicago. And a mentor of mine, Reverend Alvin Bibbs, taught me an exercise. And he said, pick up the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times and look at the way that they will tell the exact same story and look at the way they tell the story differently. Um, and that is actually a really good exercise on any issue in life. And I think when we remove it from Israel-Palestine, which is so loaded in terms of um, history, um, one of the challenges that we have is that something that might have been true in 1970 um, is not true, or it's true in a different way in 2024. And so you have you know, the issues of the Middle East has this historical context, you have religious context, you have all of these different contexts that make the conversation so much more, I hate the word complex, because I think that's an excuse to not try to understand it. So if you remove it and look at, you know, look at just Chicago, the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times and how they tell a story differently. And I'm going to share a link. This is another U.S. story. Um, remember um, Hurricane Katrina, so this was August 2005, and this is Snopes, right, fact-checking, but if you scroll down on the link that I just sent, I didn't want to bother to try to share the screen because I have 9 million things open on my screen, but if you um, follow this link on Snopes, and this is the whole question of, uh, did the news tell stories differently about race in the United States in terms of Hurricane Katrina. And if you scroll down to this, um, where it says Associated Press, there's two pictures. There's a picture of a young African-American and it says a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans. And then the next picture down is two people um, who look white. And it says two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda. And so the way these two stories are told, right? You know, here you have an African-American who's stealing and here you have white people who are hungry after a storm, right? They're just getting bread that's desperately needed. And you have, you know, a, a black um, person who is stealing. Um, this dynamic of racialization of, you know, Ben was talking about assumptions and Western assumptions. This is so prevalent in the media. 
um, particularly as it relates to Palestine. So think about terminology of terrorism, of militant, of um, the dehumanization. Looting is a term that's a dehumanizing term. This person in this picture here, you know, who looks like a kid to me, it looks like a child, um, you know, I, you can't even tell if it, that's soda or something, you know, but why is that person not viewed with the same um, humanity uh, in the middle of this storm, you know, as these white people who are just getting bread that they so desperately need. And we're seeing this dynamic um, in the United States, in the media. How long did it take for American media to start to humanize Palestinians, where almost immediately after October 7th, water, food, gas and electricity was cut off from the two plus million people living in Gaza. And we did not hear about the common humanity of Palestinians in general in the American media for weeks. It took weeks for us to start to hear that language. And that's from the media. I'm not even talking about from the White House. Um, and so some of these assumptions that Ben just articulated are prevalent in our society, let alone in the media. And so one of the things that we can do in terms of best practices is if you think about that Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times exercise, is that in seeking to discern and understand what's happening in Israel, what's happening in the occupied Palestinian territories, what's happening in Gaza, um, is, to, is to do that multiple resources analysis, which, you know, Ben mentioned um, the 10 minutes a day. Um, I started doing these updates, which I try to keep to less than 10 minutes a day. I get a little bit verbose sometimes. I apologize. But um, I go to lots of resources across the spectrum and I get criticized by everyone. I get criticized by um, people who um, I'm I'm literally quoting the news, calling what's happening a war, and the term war is criticized, right? Because people are saying this is not a war, this is a genocide. Or I will use the word conflict, and people will say this is not a conflict, you know. Um, uh, and so um, I think uh, looking at uh, multiple sources, which is one of the things I try to do in those daily updates. So I wanted to give you a few sources. Ben gave you a few. In Israel alone, there are. Um, two primary English, there's more than two, but the two primary um, English uh, sources that are translated or or at least have English versions, they are different in Hebrew. They are not direct translations. So the Hebrew news is different than the English news. But the Times of Israel, sorry, I don't know why my thumbs up. I'm not giving a thumbs up. That's just a, I don't know why that happens. The two primary sources that I would recommend um, are the Times of Israel, which is a very conservative um, uh, it's more conservative, uh, a, a source, uh, the Times of Israel and then Haaretz. And even when you look at the difference between Haaretz, and Haaretz is still very much written from a, an Israeli perspective. I mean, it's it's looking at Jewish interests. It's looking at pro, you know, Israeli interests. And so Haaretz will use words like, um, if there is something that happens, a Palestinian is um, almost de facto identified as a terrorist, even in Haaretz. And Haaretz is a liberal news source in Israel, right? Um, and just to give you an idea, I was just on the ground um, in Israel and occupied territories uh, for a couple of weeks in January. And um, uh, one of my Israeli friends said, the news is so limited in Israel and Palestine right now, it is almost as bad um, as, as Russia that, that um, Israelis are not seeing what's happening in Gaza. And Palestinians do not understand the trauma of October 7th, that the news on the ground in Israel and the OPT is so incredibly limited. So we're having this issue of having to seek to understand what's happening because so much of the news um, is either biased or telling one side of the story or they're telling it wrong, if, if I may be so bold. Um, and yet we even get so much more information than these communities that are on the ground that's so limited. And I don't know if you heard the Knesset, or, or I don't know if it was the Knesset or if it was just Netanyahu's cabinet, but they just voted um, that uh, is, um, Netanyahu's uh, cabinet has the ability to be able to shut down um, Al Jazeera because Al Jazeera in Israel was just deemed um, a national security threat to the state of Israel. So they're having issues getting information and seeing what's happening in Gaza and 
they're shutting down news sources that are bringing in some of the only images about what's happening uh, in Gaza, right? So Haaretz, um, the Times of Israel, and then Al Jazeera would be an alternative to that. And just for the record, I know Al Jazeera is funded by Qatar, but Qatar is actually more moderate than a lot of the other Arab news sources. So if you really want to know, read some of the Arab news sources that are in English that give you a more broad perspective of what the broader Arab world really thinks about some of these dynamics. And so that's one of the ways to try to get a better understanding um, about what's happening. Um, I, I talked to a CEO, this was years ago, who was who was a little, a little you know, confident in him. Now he led a multi, you know, million, billion, whatever dollar organization. And, but he said, I know a lot about the world. He said, I read five newspapers every morning. And then he went through what the newspapers were. And he was like, it's the New York times. It's the wall street journal. It's the Washington post. It's the London times. And I thought, you don't know a thing about the world because every newspaper he was reading was all right from this. I mean, maybe they're a little bit different, right? But he was not exposed to, um, some of what I'm talking about in terms of uh, diverse perspectives. Uh, they were all, you know, so Western focused is my point. Um, the other lens that is incredibly important in terms of seeking to discern and understand is having the ability to be able to put on glasses, to be able to translate what you're reading. And some of this comes from education, but terminology is so important. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, when you read a term like separation barrier, you may know that we're talking about the wall that is separating um, Israel from the OPT, 80 plus percent of it is in the occupied Palestinian territories. Separation barrier is a relatively neutral term. If you are reading something and it says the security fence, they're talking about the separation barrier, but you will know that that is coming from a very pro-Israel perspective. That's an indication of where that article is coming from. That terminology should be a little bit of a sign that everything you're reading is going to come from that lens. Or if you see apartheid wall, it will be a sign that what you're reading is coming from a lens. If you see Zionist forces versus Israeli defense forces versus, I'm trying to think of a term that would be more pro-Israel, um, you know, these terms should be indications that can help you have a lens for how to read or how to translate um, uh, what you're reading. Um, another term, you know, I mentioned that, you know, we get in trouble for using the word war. Sometimes I will say what the world is calling the war between Israel and Hamas. That is what the world is calling it. Now, many in the world are saying this could be a genocide. Some are saying it is a genocide. Some are saying it's apartheid. Um, you know, our perspective at Churches for Middle East Peace is that we are committed to the prevention of genocide. We have said that it is uh, nothing less than an ethnic cleansing. Um, and that's language we use. Um, but even the word conflict, you know, we were having a prayer vigil, this was in November, and someone was talking about the conflict. And there were protesters that started to yell and say, this is not a conflict. This is a genocide, right? And the whole point that we were having this prayer vigil was to call for an end, you know, to the bombing of Gaza. And so we were on the side of the, we were calling for the same thing that the people who were yelling <laughs> at us were calling for. And yet the term conflict to them was so provocative because it was not acknowledging um, you know, injustices that were being perpetuated. And so navigating the news um, to understand kind of you know, these terms. So conflict was one, war was one. If you see genocide, you will be able to interpret that the terminology is coming from a more pro-Palestinian perspective. Whereas if you see language about destruction of Hamas, obviously that would be more pro-Israel, uh, pro of course, right? And so um, that type of translation um, is really important um, in case that's helpful. And this is not, just for the record, this conversation is not meant to be the education. Like we don't have time to go through all of those terms. Um, but I think, um, you know, knowing um, that when you see uh, some of those trigger words or seeing those words that maybe are less neutral, um, I think can be helpful. Um, 
I, I wanted to do just before maybe um, I'll end my part. And then Ben, I think we'll skip the us talking just to go straight to question and answer just because of time, if that's okay. I just had three specific examples of where I think the news has been either hard to navigate or would be examples um, of over the past six months um, where the news maybe has led us astray. And, and these are not there are, are examples that I could give that are much harder than these, but I thought these might be helpful for us to go through. The first one was early on, you know, it took more than 20 days before the first trucks uh, were allowed into Gaza after um, Gaza has been under a blockade for um, 16 plus years. I think it's actually 18 when, when you go through um, since the blockade on Gaza began. Um, but after October 7th, um, you know, most Americans may not know, uh, Netanyahu and the Israeli government said no aid at all, nothing, no water, no food, no gas, no electricity at all until every single hostage is released. That was the position of the Israeli government. That's what Netanyahu said from the beginning. He also said all of Hamas has to be destroyed. We will go to war until all of Hamas is destroyed. It took more than 20 days before the first trucks were allowed in. And because um, you know we are obviously very involved and um, one of the things I do is I read the State Department readouts. So the media reports that come from the State Department and um, Secretary Blinken started to report on the amount of trucks that were being allowed in to Gaza. And he was reporting the numbers incorrectly. Now, this is the secretary, I was gonna say of the United States. I mean, this is like the secretary of state. He's giving numbers to the media and the media is reporting them to the world. You would think that they would get it right. And when you would compare the numbers to OSHA, when you would compare the numbers to the humanitarian people, the people that are counting the trucks, the people who whose trucks they are, the numbers were completely in, inconsistent. And so Blinken would say, we're doing great. We're getting in 50 trucks a day, right? And he's doing these averages. Well, um, by the way, it was more than 500 trucks a day before, you know, October 7th. And so I started writing to the White House and writing to the State Department. We have a relationship with them. And I just said, you guys are getting it wrong. I mean, I'm so excuse me. And um, it just, it was so frustrating. And so then he went to the Middle East and he in increased the numbers. So we were averaging 19 trucks a day and Blinken's saying we're averaging 50 trucks a day. And then he says we're averaging 100 trucks a day and the number of trucks were 30. I mean, it, it was so absurd how bad, how bad the data was. Um, and the news was quoting the State Department and the State Department's numbers were wrong. Um, and this was just an example where I, I don't know, other than like checking the data, how to, I mean, this is about how to understand myths and truth. I, I mean, I, I could see that the numbers were wrong in the news and that they were wrong coming from the State Department because we were doing the daily analysis of looking at the ocean numbers and looking at the humanitarian numbers. And I will say one of the very, very, very few successes we have had at all is that finally the State Department uh, made corrections and started to get the numbers right, you know, after this campaign of daily sending emails to the White House and to the State Department and saying, if you can't even get the number of trucks that are going into Gaza right, how can we have any confidence, you know, um, and uh, forgive me, but they have not. Uh, done much better since then. So that was one example that I wanted to raise. Um, the second example, which, you know, um, is unfortunate. If, if uh, the second example is that in the US, we often, um, there's like a wall between international media and between media that we get in the US. And so one of the ways that we can bridge that wall is by me reading international media. So if you're reading Haaretz, if you're reading media from Arab sources, if you're media, reading um, you know, media directly from overseas, we will have a lot more information than just reading media in the US. This is my second example, because a lot of things did not get translated or did not get picked up by US media. And the two specific examples in that regard are the rhetoric that came from Israeli officials um, and rhetoric that was coming from Hamas. And so um, 
you know, very early on, and this was a lot of the data that was used by South Africa in the International Court of Justice, but there was so much rhetoric coming from officials of the Israeli government um, that was so dehumanizing towards Palestinians, and it just was not picked up uh, by U.S. media. You know, I mean, Gallant, uh, the defense minister of Israel, said there will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed as we fight these animals. You know, the people in Gaza are animals and we will act accordingly. Um, there are, um, I'm actually getting this, Ben, from that graphic that you <laughs> posted, you know, of all of the officials, um, you know, in Israel. Um, another uh, soldier from the Israeli, the spokesperson from the Israeli army said, we're dropping hundreds and tons of bombs on Gaza. Our focus is on complete destruction, not accuracy, right? So these are direct quotes. Like that's a direct quote from the army spokesperson. But then in US media, there's questions about, there's questions about like whether or not, you know, like that's just not picked up in the US media is my point. I won't go through all of those quotes. There's many of them, but that's, um, uh, I wanted to mention that on the Israel side. And then I don't know how many of you know, the first hostages that were released by Hamas, they were not negotiated. They were released by Hamas. Um, and I am not in any way defending. I am just saying it was not reported. You know, the two American hostages who were released, Hamas released them. Hamas said they were releasing them because they wanted the world to know not to believe what American, what the American government says about them. And that was not reported in the American news. And then the next hostages that were released were Israeli hostages. And most Americans don't know because it was not reported in our media. The Israeli hostages were not even received by Israel. So they couldn't go um, later on, you know, during the big hostage exchange, Israel received the hostages. When the first Israeli hostages were released, they had to be released through Egypt and then flown from Cairo to Tel Aviv because Israel would not accept the hostages. And that's an example of something that was not reported in U.S. media. And then my last example, and then I'll stop, you know, we can open it up for questions, is... Um, the most recent visit between Biden and Saudi Arabia um, is just one of the challenges we have as well is that officials will say something and then even on the same day, they might change what they're saying. And so you have where they say something and you think that you understand what's happening, but then they change what they're saying, <laughs> right? And so um, how do we like follow the news when even what's coming out officially as statements is so inconsistent? And so my example is Secretary Blinken, because this whole question on what is the American government's position towards a full scale invasion towards Rafa? And oh, my goodness, the Americans have said we oppose it. Then they said we only oppose it if there's not a plan to safely evacuate the population of Rafa. And so in literally a 48 hour period of time, Secretary Blinken said to media in Saudi Arabia, he said, we've been clear, we completely oppose a ground invasion in Rafah. That's what he said in Saudi Arabia. And then 48 hours later, Gallant is in Washington DC and he said, we're okay with a ground scale invasion in Rafah as long as there's a plan um, you know, to be able to evacuate people safely. Now, what the White House said is they said, well, there's no such plan that would allow for people to be safely evacuated. But then the White House said it's okay as long as it's not a full-scale invasion. And so you're like, what is the White House saying? And part of the issue is they're completely not clear. They say one thing in Saudi Arabia to the Arab community. They say one thing to the Israelis and they're changing their messaging, which then makes it a challenge, obviously, um, to follow, you know, what's being communicated. So that's probably more than enough from me, but we have um, some time uh, for questions. Uh, we don't have time for a discussion. So I would ask that people really um, keep it to questions as opposed to comments, if that's okay. Um, but we would invite questions. You could put them in the chat. Um, I do think there's a Q&A function as well. Um, May we've we've got one question um, that was just dropped in the chat by Carol. Um, should we start there? Sure, that's great. You want to ask it? Sure. Um, Carol, would you like to put your um, your your microphone and ask yourself, or should I just read this? 
Uh, you can go ahead and read it. <laughs> okay, all right. So Carol asks, do you think there's a backstory about Hamas? What it has done in Gaza over the, the 17 years to support the civilian population during the siege, like administering the hospital system, communications, et cetera. In other words, is the actual story of Hamas not totally evil? And I'll add, Carol, I really appreciate your question because this, it, it's, it's, um, I mean, in, in one way, it feels like a dangerous question to ask. Like, what what are you doing? Like, what's your motivation for asking that question? Um, but uh, this came up for me um, a few weeks ago when Mike Cosper wrote an article for Christianity Today, which was ostensibly about um, the evil uh, ideology of Hamas, in which he repeated some talking points about how evil they they are, and then he and then the article did something completely different. It 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 was not an analysis of Hamas's ideology. Um, there are other people who have done that, and if you go read those, you actually learn a lot about Hamas, about their ideas, about why they do what they do, but we don't ever see anything like that in the West because for this reason, like we, it, it feels like, oh, are you like trying to justify what they did? That kind of a thing. Um, and, um, so, uh, so really appreciate your question. May, do you, would you like yeah. to? I mean, I think, um, I'll start by saying, um, what happened on October 7th was evil. Um, and I, I watched the videos, um, uh, that were the private videos that were screened, um, from cameras, you know, from people's homes in kibbutzes and things like that. And I, I mean, I think, you know, as a Christian, as a follower of the Prince of Peace, I believe violence is evil. Um, and so I think it's really, um, I, I think that, um, I've been talking about, um, I've been talking about a macro perspective and a micro perspective. And I think, um, the acknowledgement that what happened on October 7th, uh, it was, it was not only a trauma, you know, it was the most horrific attack, uh, certainly towards the state of Israel, but also towards Jewish people since the Holocaust that has been stated, but it's also true. And I think yeah. understanding that and understanding what that experience was like for Jewish people, I think understanding that also for Jewish people who felt that the state of Israel, the role of the state was to protect them. And so the state failed them. There is so much in that, that actually is really, really critical to understanding, to understanding what's happening and even understanding, I mean, I was speaking to a Jewish rabbi who said, think about the ego and the shame experienced by um, those in power in Israel, political power, but military power. I mean, there's a lot there, right? So I think it's very, very important for me personally, also organizationally, like what happened on October 7th was evil. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, I also was speaking to a rabbi who um, was in a Hamas attack in the 1980s where a bus was blown up and one of his best friends was killed. And so like mechanisms, um, mechanisms that have been used uh, historically, I think that's also important to understand. Now, yeah. according to international law, an occupied power has the right to resist militarily against a military. And that's not what October 7th was. Maybe 20% of it was, maybe 5% of it was, but that's not how it manifested itself. And differentiating those things is important. I think understanding that Hamas is also not monolithic is really important. There was there was a political wing. Many people have said the political wing uh, did not know what was happening on October 7th. They also have not condemned what happened on October 7th. So I think, um, I think all of that is important to understand and, you know, what Ben started talking about in terms of like Western versus Eastern and the, this false binary, that's also important to understand. It's not this like good versus evil, West versus East versus West, you know, type thing either that that um, any liberation struggle coming from a Palestinian perspective is by default terrorist and evil, right? And I, I put in here, and I think this is important, 
um, that there has been a movement historically um, that has come very close in language that has not been as clear as acknowledging Israel's right to exist. But there has been uh, conversations about rewriting Hamas's charter, and there have been people who have been connected to the Hamas movement who have been... Um, you know, potentially willing to pursue peace. Now, many people would say they fooled you. October 7th is the proof that, you know, that that, that wasn't legitimate. Um, and I think all of that's kind of being reanalyzed and reconsidered in light of this current moment, if you will. Um, but honestly, um, we talk all the time about the establishment of the state of Israel. Ha Haganah and the Ergun were terrorist movements prior to the establishment of the state of Israel. Arafat was considered a terrorist and then he won the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, that does not in any way diminish the horrors of October 7th and the evils of that. But in order to pursue peace and find a way forward, there has to be an acknowledgement of the oppression and occupation of the Palestinian people. Um, and there has to be um, a willingness to believe, uh, I'm not talking about with the perpetrators of October 7th, I think that's a different conversation, um, but there has to be um, a belief that there can be an alternative way forward. Um, I see Andy's hand, if, if we could go to her next. Uh, yeah, just quickly, I was wondering if you could just say more specifically, I feel like I'm deluged with, you know, everything was great in Gaza, they were all rich and happy, and then they just blew stuff up, and all the targets are all actually military targets, and no civilians are getting killed, they're all really the military, and it's the war, the information war is all on Moss's part, not Israel's part, blah, blah, blah. Like, how do I walk through all that morass of shenanigans? um yeah thanks so you're kind of asking for a little bit more uh, like answer the question on a concrete level i i think she was asking uh, yeah not, not, not just the answer to the question but how like someone's saying this how do i go you know i mean i can give a philosophical thing but they'll say yeah i, I agree with 100 percent. the information more is fox does that make sense like right. so what's more something more specific that yeah to be guided to to say, hey, maybe you should yeah. maybe want and not to say that there's not misinformation across the spectrum, but yeah, when it's that lopsided, yeah. what what what's next in that conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, um I, I started my fellowship um when Shireen Abu Akhle was assassinated. It was around that time. And so some of my first projects and research was into what happened with Shireen Abu Akhle. And I don't know if those of you on the call, if you remember that she was a Palestinian journalist, beloved across the Middle East, who was shot by a sniper uh, in Janine as she was reporting on, um, on, I believe, an Israeli incursion into the, the refugee camp there. And, um, and she was, you know, she was shot at multiple times until she was killed. Uh, and then there was this investigation into what happened. And if you you may remember, the Israelis came out right away and said it was the Palestinians. It was the it was the you know the, the Palestinian gunmen in the area who were shooting, um, you know, in a wild and erratic manner. And and they and it was one of their bullets that killed her. Um, and then it after you know a proper investigation. Um, it turned out that that's not what happened. Um, and Israel had to backtrack what they kept insisting was had happened. And it, it was a, an Israeli sniper who targeted her and shot her from inside of a truck that was just down the, the road from where she was, you know, even though she was standing with a group of other journalists they were all wearing their proper identification you know with the word press across their chest very visible from far away they had identified themselves when they arrived to the israeli soldiers um but there is uh you know a concerted effort to reframe what happened by the israeli you know the israelis um made an attempt to re-narrate that story um and they they got caught 
and um, and had to acknowledge what actually happened. So that was in the back of my mind. That has been in the back of my mind throughout this year. Um, as I read things that are happening right now, like for example, um, you know, unfolding as we speak, um, the the narrative about what happened to the seven aid workers is is it, um, it, you know. It's up in the air, what, like what the official line is going to be, and you know, there's the results of the the initial investigation. Now there are other groups that are insisting that there be a, a, a third party investigation that takes place um, that hasn't taken place. So, so like the final word on what happened has not been settled yet, um, but that's in the back of my mind. Like what what they did in trying to tell the story about Shreen Abu Akhle as I watch this and then add to that things like um, the same day that I heard about that bombing, uh, you know, the targeting of those, um, those aid workers with world central kitchen. Um, I, there was another story that came out right around, it might've been the same day by nine, seven, two, an investigative reporting piece on um, uh, the AI that Israel is using to generate target lists for bombing. This one uh, is called Lavender, the, the AI that they that they use and that this story is, is kind of talking about based on input from seven whistleblowers, people with direct experience of Lavender and how it's being used. Um, and, uh, and, um, you know that 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 article follows on one from November about another AI that they're that Israel has just started using that they've called the Gospel. The Gospel is the AI that they use for generating bombing lists of buildings. Lavender is the one that they use for um, kill lists of people. And so both of these have been operating, and both of them are in the background based on what nine seven two has uncovered. Um, it, are a, a major factor in the volume of bombs dropped that we've seen. So I read that one. Same day, I read about the 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 aid convoy being targeted, and I can't help but read them in connection with each other. But then when Israel comes out and says, uh, it was a misidentification. I actually, I believe that, but what they're really talking about and what, what's left strategically ambiguous in that, in that admission is that it was a misidentification by this AI. And if you read the article, the AI, uh, when they tested it at the beginning of the war, they said, uh, it, it it generated uh, it, it had an error rate of ten percent, but they decided that that was acceptable. So that it's very hard for me to read um, those two pieces together as um, uh, as anything other than the, those seven aid workers. They were part of that ten percent, and Israel is calling their the way they're framing it is a misidentification. And a violation of uh, of standard procedure, um, so that we can all kind of get back to, um, you know, not worrying too much about the their standard procedures. Um, so I don't know. That's a story. That's a personal experience. But it's it's a specific example. And Andy, I think of what you're asking about. I'm sensitive to the fact that this is our hour mark. Um, I can stay for another 10 minutes or so. Are you good, Ben, to go yep. a bit more? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we can um, have another another bit for the questions. I just, if you do need to go, certainly feel free. Um, but uh, if there are more questions, um, I did want to just acknowledge that we had scheduled this for an hour and that we were at the hour mark. So uh, if you need to leave, certainly feel free.
And if there's not any other questions, that's okay too. Yes, Tiana. I'll just, I could just ask it if that's cool. Um, sometimes I, I think my concern as a pastor and somebody who is about justice is how do we help the church to see the urgency? Like we yesterday in church are doing our justice creed as we uh, quote every Sunday, which I think our church wrote, which is beautiful. And beforehand, I'm like, there's so, and I'm, I'm kind of getting hyped and like, there's so much we need to do. And, you know, we can't lose heart. And I'm just feeling like people are just looking at me like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and just how do we, the narrative, some of it's the narrative. I think there's different narratives as we're talking about that people have, um, but just show how do we present that there's an urgency to our being involved, to staying in it, to being willing to do all that we need to do as comfortable Westerners. And I think that's part of the problem, but just that urgency with matters of justice and this being one of them, I'm just always like, y'all come on, like, and talk, talk to me, talk back to me, you know, but um, how do we, how do we help our, our congregations, our neighborhoods, our people to, uh, see the urgency at this time. Um, I think one of the ways is proximity. I think, you know, when people we love are hurt, then we're motivated. And if we don't know them, we can't love them. Um, and so I think some of it has to do with proximity. And I think that can be one of the challenges, you know, people who have um, traveled to the region are invested, you know, so people who know people, uh, people who know Mitri Rahab, right? Mitri Rahab is a pastor from Bethlehem and Dar al Kalima is one of the schools in Bethlehem. They have a satellite location that was just bombed in, in uh, Gaza. And so when you hear like someone I know was affected, um, that's one of the ways that it touches our hearts more. Um, and so how do we, how do we bring this closer to home? I think it's really, um, one of the questions, um, you know, we try to do that by bringing Palestinians here or bringing, you know, Israeli human rights leaders here sometimes. And I think that this is unfortunate sometimes with a lot of our churches, they won't hear from a Palestinian or they won't hear from a Palestinian unless we bring someone from Israel that's standing next to them. Right. And I think that's unfortunate, but if that's what it takes, then, you know, we at least start there. Right. And so um, we try to bring speakers here to come to your churches to say, you know, OK, if you can't care about Palestinians in Gaza for their own humanity, do you know we have brothers and sisters in Christ that are literally taking refuge in churches there? Right. And so maybe that's a starting point. And so um like, what is it that your church is uniquely called to, um, what are the issues that get them riled up? Like, sometimes it's the environment, sometimes it's, you know, and so finding those touch points, um, I, I think are, are the ways that then people get invested. I'll, I'll add a couple of those touch points that I think are that, like, the common ground is children, like in general, American Christians care about children. They're moved by children being, you know, affected. Um, and there are ways that that gets mitigated sometimes. Like I think that the the narrative about Hamas using human shields has basically kind of like diffused the power of the narratives of suffering children in, in Gaza for a lot of a lot of folks who are not very motivated to pay close attention. Uh, but children, um, and things that are, are not necessarily that are are political, but um, that we don't necessarily think of as political, like water, for example. Like um, that's why I, that's why May and I chose to write about water instead of writing about bombings or um, you know uh, aid that's being um, restricted because it might have guns in the trucks you know coming in or you know that kind of thing water people can think of as pretty all political and everyone can kind of understand oh yeah like it, it's pretty inhuman to restrict water getting to suffering people those I, i've found to be like um uh like not so far out ahead of our readers that we lose them 
but just far enough that we have some kind of context where we can gain a hearing uh, and um, you know, hopefully make some progress that way. Good to see you, Tiana. Likewise. Yeah, absolutely. I see a couple more questions. The UNRWA question, I put a link to one of their most recent um, reports. Um, UNRWA is still active. You know, one of the things that was so brutal about UNRWA is the U.S. withheld UNRWA funding, even though it wasn't due for like another year. Like, like the U.S. did not have um, any um, payments that were going to be, I don't know if it was nine months or something, but the U.S. saying that they were cutting their funding of UNRWA is part of what triggered so many other countries to say they were going to cut UNRWA funding. This was in response to the accusations by Israel that some of the UNRWA is the U.N. refugee Workers Association, um, that is the number one agency that's delivering aid into Gaza. Um, and right after the case was brought forward um, at the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, uh, Israel accused some of the staffers um, of um, UNRWA as having been complicit in the October 7th attacks. UNRWA immediately um, fired them, uh, started an investigation. Since then, there has been a report that those workers actually were um, interrogated and, and perhaps even tortured um, to confess to Israel. Um, and so that is being investigated. So um, there's not any clear evidence that's been brought forward about those charges. Um, uh, but UNRWA is still um, active in Gaza. Um, they have not been allowed in North Gaza. And so North Gaza, there's about 300,000 people in North Gaza. And that is where um, famine is uh, imminent. That is where there's the most extreme issues in terms of um, lack of uh access to clean water. Um, Israel did just say they would turn on the water in North Gaza, I heard, and Israel said that they would open the ERA's checkpoint uh, for humanitarian aid. Uh, it was just reported that today 300 trucks were allowed into Gaza, um, which is a very significant number. It's still not anywhere near close uh, to the 500, and 500 was what was needed before you know, October 7th. So if the number was 500 without, you know, that was when water was turned on. That was, you know, of course, you know, the minimum amount needed before October 7th. Um, but UNRWA is still very active. Um, they are underfunded because of all of the cuts. Uh, and that report there would give you information about that as well. Um, and then I think uh, maybe this will be the last question, Ben. Any other? I thought there was one more question today. Oh, how do you rate democracy now? I'll let you take that one. I really appreciate um, engaging with what Democracy Now! offers um, alongside many other sources that I that I perceive. I, I don't I haven't found any source that gets me the whole way by itself. And so, you know, but uh, and I'm not sure how Democracy Now! is rated in the Ad Fontes um, media, but they 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 are very committed to kind of in-depth conversations with their guests which i really appreciate because it allows you to get it allows them to get in beyond talking points to a, an analysis of you know what the guest is seeking to to portray or their experience the story they're telling um and to probe some of you know some of its some of the weaknesses and strengths and and so on. So um, wherever you you see that, you, even though you know it, it probably would line up on the left side of that media chart, um, you just know that about it and and engage with it. And I, for me, it's the 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 more salient axis in that chart is not the left to right; it's the like are, are they are they focused on and committed to quality reporting or not? I want to stay at the top of that chart and I want to read broadly across the top. That's kind of where I fit. And that would, you know, be one of the one of them towards the top that is that is on the left side of the chart. Thank that you. Yep. Thanks for that. Yeah. I see Andy's comment too. How do you handle the accusation that Hamas is causing the suffering in Gaza? So storied of um, 
of suffering getting neutralized. You know, I mean, I think from my perspective, um, uh, we pay attention to when you have death tolls of 13,000 plus children being killed, does it really matter whose fault it is? It just has to stop, right? And so I think that would be the perspective of um, the, the blaming Hamas as a justification for the death tolls to continue. Um, up until the last week or so, there the average number of Palestinians being killed per day was more than 180 Palestinians per day, which uh, meant a Palestinian was being killed every eight minutes. Um, and so the, the, the reasons and the cause doesn't matter, but as people of faith, you know, for those of us who choose to follow Jesus, um, that's not okay. And so we've just been saying, stop the killing, stop the death, stop the destruction. And, and also that we have to stop the cycles of violence for the sake of children in Gaza, for the sake of Palestinian children, for the sake of generations of children in Palestine and in Israel. And, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is there are many approaches in terms of reason. There's a moral argument to be made for the sake of humanity. <laughs> this is wrong morally, but it's also pragmatically, it's it's pragmatically bad for Israel. I mean, Chuck Schumer is the highest ranking Jewish person ever elected in American politics. And he is saying Israel is becoming a pariah state. He is saying, I mean, he's one of the most pro-Israel politicians. And he's saying this is bad for Israel. So if you can't do it for the sake of Palestinian children, stop, you know, for pragmatic reasons. And then we've been saying, um, because we've been ineffective as of yet at shifting US policy. We've been um, engaging in a third tier strategy that we call the persistent widow strategy of the persistent widow who goes before the unjust judge and she's right and she's seeking justice and the judge is unjust and she keeps going forward every single day and uh, finally the unjust judge gets so sick of her that he gives her justice just to get her to go away. And so we're pursuing moral strategy, pragmatic strategy, and the persistent widow strategy um, to seek to bring an end to death and destruction and violence for the sake of you know, the people of Gaza, but for the sake of all of the people of the Holy Land. So go ahead, Ben, we'll give you the last word. Okay, yeah, just, just to, to add my two cents to the, to the good question. Um, yeah, I, I think that that, um, that statement, uh, works because of the, the, um, the, the partly accurate, but partly orientalist assessment that Palestinians are irrationally violent against Jews. And, um, that, uh, you know, and that that's true of all Palestinians and of Arabs broadly. Um, and uh, and what I want to offer um, as an alternative is actually it, it's centered in a book. It's called a, I think it's called um, yeah, how terrorism ends. It's by a scholar who um, who studied hundreds of cases of like terrorist groups, groups that had been labeled terrorist. Um, you know, over the course of history and across the world. So in all different kinds of geographies and um, uh, including Hamas is in there and and so on. And there are probably six or seven different ways that, that terrorist groups end. Um, and one of them is through like overwhelming force. So the approach that Israel is taking right now and the the assessment that that this scholar gives to all of the cases where that was attempted is it doesn't work it basically doesn't work there are a variety of other ways that terrorism comes to an end and one of them is when um the political conditions change to make ter you know the resorting to evil terrorist acts um, less attractive. And right now we're in a situation where Palestinians, some Palestinians that I you know have spoken with are like, nothing works. 
and that that is that is a situation that um that the world and that Israel and other countries working together can change the political landscape um uh, in 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 such a way so that um Palestinians um uh who want to be constructive partners for peace have avenues for doing that if that makes sense thank you well thank you um i'm going to just put a few things in the chat and we're going to close thank you uh for those who were able to stay longer i know we went uh, we should have scheduled this for 90 minutes instead of an hour um but i did want to invite you you know during holy week we partnered with a number of international groups um, and came out with a bishop's letter that had originally 140 bishops and executive leaders calling for a comprehensive ceasefire um, release of hostages um, from Gaza and release of prisoners who are held in Israel without due process, uh, calling for immediate and adequate um, humanitarian assistance into Gaza, calling for actually a withholding of weapons from Israel. Um, and we're now inviting individual signatories to that letter. So that's that take action link. And then I wanted to just leave you with, you know, we would encourage you to sign up for the newsletters of our respective organizations. So Churches for Middle East Peace um, is there. Uh, we'd invite you to sign up for their newsletter, our, our newsletter, NIMI, the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East. Um, and then, of course, um, this was hosted by uh, Evangelicals for Justice. So those are all the links there in the chat. This video will be available um, on Evangelicals for Justice's YouTube. We'll put it on CMEP's YouTube as well. Those links will be available in the chat um, on YouTube, you know, if you haven't found them today. So grateful for you joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you for your engagement. And may God go before us toward peace. So many blessings um, and grateful for your being with us. So good to see you.